Okay, so we're going to switch our attention now uh, down to the pancreas uh, uh, and move uh, to uh, some common mistakes in the management of acute pancreatitis uh, inflammatory fluid collections uh, by my colleague, Dr. Stephen Kim. Hi, good morning. So my name is Stephen Kim. I'm uh, one of the interventional endoscopy gastroenterologists here at UCLA. And uh, I'm sandwiched between two of our visiting professors, so I will uh, try to hold up my end of the bargain here. All right, so my talk is on common mistakes in the management of acute pancreatitis and inflammatory fluid collections. I have no disclosure, sadly. So let's start with a case. So a 42-year-old woman presents with right upper quadrant abdominal pain. Her liver tests are mildly elevated. Amylase and lipase levels are normal. Abdominal ultrasound reveals gallstones, as well as a five millimeter stone in the distal common bile duct. She undergoes an ERCP with successful removal of a small, single, gold-colored stone. So the day after her ERCP, she has no abdominal pain. However, the serum amylase le and lipase levels were checked in this patient. They were in the 300s. And in the chart, it says, plan asymptomatic pancreatitis post-ERCP, tolerating a clear liquid diet since post-procedure Continue to trend the amylase and lipase levels. If develops any new abdominal pain with eating, plan to make NPO and continue IV fluids for hydration. And so I wasn't sure what this asymptomatic pancreatitis term is. So some of the common mistakes I found in this case. One, serum amylase and lipase levels were obtained in an asymptomatic patient following the ERCP. And two, post-ERCP pancreatitis was diagnosed in a patient without any symptoms. All right, so just to go over some of these definitions. So a post-ERCP pancreatitis, this was defined back in 1991 and has been subsequently been used in a lot of the studies, is defined as having new or worsened abdominal pain following the ERCP, causing new or prolongation hospitalization for at least two days. The serum amylase, lip, the serum amylase level has to be greater than three times the upper limit of normal, measured more than 24 hours after the ERCP. All right. And the reason for this is the following. When they've measured amylase levels after an ERCP, you find that in up to 75% of patients, the amylase level is elevated. But post-ERCP pancreatitis is only seen in about 3.5% of patients after an ERCP. So just the fact that you have an elevated amylase level after an ERCP does not define post-ERCP pancreatitis. All right, we're going to move on to the next case. And uh, I'll just caveat, to start with the caveat saying that this case is not real. I'm just highlighting some of the mistakes that are made in, uh, in these patients. All right, so this is a 47-year-old woman who presents with acute epigastric abdominal pain that radiates to her back. And the pain began shortly after eating a juicy hamburger made on her new Weber grill. So here are vital signs in the ER. She's got a low-grade temperature, heart rate to 102, and otherwise stable. Here are labs on admission, and I'll just highlight the labs that are abnormal. She's got a little bit of a leukocytosis, a white count of 15,000. Her BUN's up a little bit at 21. And then her LFTs, or amylase lipase, are markedly elevated. She gets an abdominal ultrasound. The gallbladder wall thinks this is normal at 2.5 millimeters, but there are gallstones present in the gallbladder. There are no stones seen in the common bile duct, and there's no evidence of intrahepatic duct dilation. And these are the uh, findings reported by the radiologist. All right, so cholelithiasis, no evidence of acute cholecystitis, and no intra- or extrahepatic biliary duct dilation. <clears throat> so the patient is admitted to the hospital for presumed gallstone pancreatitis. The patient is kept strictly MPO and placed on intravenous lactative ringer solution. And due to low-grade fevers and leukocytosis, the patient is started on antibiotics. So her abdominal pain significantly improves over the first three days. And here are her labs over the first three days of her hospitalization. And basically the trend is all the liver tests as well as their serum amylase and lipase are improving. And so the, the question I had for the, for the audience, which I don't know is going to work anymore, is the patient continues to have elevated serum amylase and lipase levels on day three of her hospitalization. How would you provide nutrition to this patient? Strict MPO, oral feeding, enteral feeding through a nasal jejunal tube, or initiate parental nutrition? Okay, let's just do hands. So who would keep this patient MPO? Start oral feeding, okay? Enteral feeding through a nasal jejunal tube, and initiate parental nutrition. All right, so most of you guys would do oral feeding. 
So this is a randomized trial looking at patients with mild acute pancreatitis. And basically, they're looking at the days before starting oral feeding. And in one group, they said, we're going to follow your lipase levels. And when it drops below two times the upper limit of normal, we'll start to feed you. The other group basically got to start eating whenever they felt hungry. Right? They didn't care what the lipase level was. You got to eat whenever you felt um, you could start eating again. And so what they found was that the group that self-selected, meaning they got to eat whenever they were hungry, started to eat a day before the group that was monitored by using lipase levels. And so their basic conclusion was that uh, you can start feeding these patients without following lipase levels at all. Just follow the patient's clinical uh, status. And this difference was statistically significant. When you look at enteral feeding versus parenteral feeding, this, is, this comes up a lot in patients with more severe uh, acute pancreatitis. This is a Cochrane database, a, a systematic review, meta-analysis, looking at eight randomized control trials, looking at, the, looking at these outcomes, mortality, multiple organ failure, systemic infection, and surgical intervention. And this is a forest plot, and if you follow, the left side favors enteral nutrition, the right side favors parental nutrition, you find that basically every outcome Enteral nutrition was favored over parental nutrition. Right? The, idea, the idea being that enteral nutrition should be considered the standard for, uh, for care in patients with severe acute pancreatitis. So again, I agree with the audience here. Oral feeding is probably the answer. Um, especially mild pancreatitis can be restarted once the abdominal pain is decreasing and inflammatory markers are improving. And you should not use the serum amylase and lipase levels to guide the management of pancreatitis. Okay, so then this patient continues on. She started on TPN. Again, this is a made-up case for the purposes of today's discussion. And then they wait, and they follow the serum amylase and lipase levels. They continue to drop on days four and five. And finally, on day six, they decide to allow her to start taking clears. Her diet is advanced for the next few days. And finally, on day 10 of the hospitalization, she gets discharged. All right, so common mistakes that were presented in this case. One, serum amylase and lipase levels were used to guide clinical management, and we discussed that already. And two, parental nutrition was initiated as the primary nutritional support. So there are a couple of other mistakes that were made in this case. The other was that prophylactic antibiotics were implemented. So what's the role of prophylactic antibiotics in acute pancreatitis? And again, another meta-analysis looking at um, giving prophylactic antibiotics or not in patients with acute pancreatitis. Another four spot here looking at these outcomes, mortality, preventing infected pancreatic necrosis, non -prevent, uh, preventing non-pancreatic infections, or preventing surgical intervention. And once again, you see that if the group on the left favors antibiotics, the group on the right favors not giving antibiotics, and you see that all these diamonds basically cross midline. And so their, their, uh, their conclusion was that there's no data to support the routine use of prophylactic antibiotics in patients with severe acute pancreatitis. So based on, these, based on this evidence, the acute pancreatitis guidelines suggest that the routine antibiotic prophylaxis is not recommended in the management of acute pancreatitis and antibiotics are indicated in patients only with suspected or confirmed infected necrotizing pancreatitis. All right, and then there's another mistake that was, that was, uh, that was made in this care of this patient. And this was that cholecystectomy was not recommended during the index admission for gallstone pancreatitis, right? She was in the hospital for 10 days, they never suggested it, never saw a surgeon, and was sent home. So timing of cholecystectomy seems to be important. And this was suggested in a study uh, where they did a systematic review of nine studies looking at patients who underwent their gallbladder surgery during the index admission of their gallstone pancreatitis, or they got it done after discharge. And so in this group, you see 483 patients got their gallbladder taken out during the admission, whereas 515 patients got it done afterwards. So the interval cholecystectomy was found to, be, found to take place about 40 days after they were hospitalized in this group. And 18% of these patients, so 95%, 95 patients actually came back to the hospital between the time they left the hospital and before they got their gallbladder surgery. So 43 patients end up getting biliary pancreatitis again, 17 presented with acute cholecystitis, and 35 ended up having symptoms of biliary colic. So again, based on this evidence, the timing of cholecystectomy is recommended to be done during the index admission for mild biliary pancreatitis. Interval cholecystectomy is associated with, with a substantial risk in their current episodes of biliary events. And then cholecystectomy can be or should be delayed in patients with pancreatic fluid collections. So no surgeon is going to be excited about going in and doing a cholecystectomy in patients who have a large number of peripancreatic fluid collections. And so those patients can wait to get their gallbladder taken out. 
All right, so those are the lessons learned in this case. Move on to this last case. So the same 47-year-old woman is discharged home, and right, she didn't undergo her cholecystectomy as recommended. So not surprisingly, a month later, she presents to the hospital again with acute epigastric abdominal pain radiating to her back. She's afebrile and hemodynamically stable. And her labs are notable, again, for elevated amylase and lipase, consistent with acute pancreatitis. So here's our CT scan, and you see this, um, you see the pancreas lighting up nicely in the middle of the picture there, and then there's some fluid collections that are highlighted by the, uh, by the white arrows. So the audience response question, which we won't, have, we won't have, be able to do, is what is the correct term to describe this pancreatic fluid collection? A, a pancreatic pseudocyst, B, acute peripancreatic fluid collection, C, acute necrotic collection, D, walled off necrosis, or E, just some smuts around the pancreas. So again, we'll just do it with a show of hands. A, pancreatic pseudocyst. B, acute peripancreatic fluid collection. Okay. C, acute necrotic collection. D, walled off necrosis. Or E, some schmutz around the pancreas. All right, so most of you guys chose B. All right, so let's talk about pancreatic fluid collections. So this is a local complication of acute pancreatitis, and it's seen in up to about 10% of acute pancreatitis cases. Um, you can develop necrosis of pancreatic tissue, which can contribute to this. And when there is necrosis, it usually follows some steps. Liquefaction of necrosis it becomes organized and then ultimately walled off. And I think necrosis is what we always worry about with patients with acute pancreatitis. And so this is when to suspect the necrosis. So it typically evolves over the first several days of the hospitalization. It can lead to persistent or recurrent abdominal pain or distension. So rather than improving, they're actually getting worse or the pain is not dissipating. They develop signs of sepsis but they start to develop worsening organ dysfunction. And so here are a couple of examples of acute necrotic collections. Um, so the one on the left is, you, know, you see this uh, heterogeneous collection within the, within the pancreas. And on the right, this is actually walled off necrosis where you see a, a nicely encapsulated um, collection. It, again, it looks heterogeneous. There's even this, um, like a, small cystic cavity or something in there with the, with the uh, black little arrowheads. And so this was the Atlanta, Atlanta classification that came out in 2013. This was helped clarify and define these different types of peripancreatic fluid collections. So if it's all liquid and it presents in less than four weeks, it's called an acute peripancreatic fluid collection. Over four weeks, there's no necrosis and that collection continues to be there. It's called a pancreatic pseudocyst. However, if there's any type of solid component that's evidence of necrosis or debris within the, within the cystic cavity. Less than four weeks, it's considered an acute necrotic collection. Greater than four weeks, it's called walled off necrosis. All right. So these are the definitions that we typically use to describe these peripancreatic fluid collections. I think for most of the lay public, the, you know, the, the medicine doctors, even the radiologists, they a lot of times just call these pancreatic pseudocysts. All right. So um, we have a more, uh, more specific definition for these terms. So if we were to look at acute pancreatitis, it comes in two flavors. 90% of the time, it's interstitial acute pancreatitis. And 10% of the time, you get developed necrotizing pancreatitis. So not all these patients develop peripancreatic fluid collections, but when they do, this is what can happen. So in less than four weeks, the patients with interstitial acute pancreatitis can develop acute peripancreatic fluid collections. If you have necrotizing pancreatitis, you can develop an acute necrotic collection around the pancreas. And after four weeks, if the acute peripancreatic fluid collection becomes too organized, it can develop into a pancreatic pseudocyst. With necrotizing pancreatitis, you can go from acute necrotic collections to walled off necrosis. And these patients can also develop pancreatic pseudocyst from the necrotizing pancreatitis alone. So in terms of general management, the really the algorithm now is to watch and wait for most of these patients. Right? So 60% of these fluid collections spontaneously resolve so there's no rush to necessarily have to do anything for these fluid collections when you see them. However, if they're symptomatic, if they're having sepsis, ongoing abdominal pain, then it is a reason to go in and, and intervene. And the drainage of these fluid collections can be done endoscopically, percutaneously, or surgically. So just getting back to this question, what's the correct term to describe this peripancreatic fluid collection? And I agree with the audience, this is an acute peripancreatic fluid collection based on the Atlantic classification. All right, so we're going to go on with the case. So again, they make a mistake here. So IR is requested to aspirate the fluid collection to evaluate for necrosis. 
And of course, the FNA is negative because this is an acute peripancular fluid collection. There's no necrosis here to begin with. So not surprising, the FNA is negative. The patient's discharged home after pancreatitis symptoms improve. But six weeks later, her abdominal pain is completely gone. For some reason, they get a CT scan on her anyway, and they find that she's got this four centimeter cyst in the head of the pancreas. So what would you do next for this patient? A, watch and wait. B, endoscopic drainage. C, percutaneous drainage. Or D, surgical resection of the pseudocyst. And again, we'll take hands. A, watch and wait. Okay. B, endoscopic drainage. C, percutaneous drainage. And D, surgical resection. All right, good. So most people chose to watch and wait. You guys are paying attention. All right, so this is a retrospective study looking at patients with pancreatic pseudocysts. And they just followed these patients and said, you know, this is retrospective. So they said, did they get severe complications requiring some sort of urgent procedure? Did they get an elective operation because they were symptomatic? Or did, they, or did the pseudocyst um, resolve or the patient's asymptomatic? And what you find is that a gross majority of the patients either had, res you know, basically the, the pseudocyst resolved on their own or patients were made asymptomatic. And so the recommendations from this study were to just watch and wait, all right? So most patients, you can just wait to see what happens. To develop symptoms, yes, you can intervene, but if not symptomatic, there's no need to rush in and do something just because there's radiographic evidence of a pancreatic pseudocyst. So they should have left her alone, but they didn't. All right, so the patient undergoes an ERCP for attempted transpapillary drainage. The ERCP is technically unsuccessful as the pancreatic duct is unable to be can can cannulated. And several weeks later, the patient develops worsening abdominal pain and distension. So now time has progressed. She gets a repeat CT scan. And now the cyst in the head of the pancreas is even larger than it was before. And now she's symptomatic. This is the coronal view. So what would you do next for this patient? A, watch and wait. B, ERCP with pancreatic duct stent placement. C, endoscopic cyst gastrostomy. D, ERCP with pancreatic duct stent and endoscopic cyst gastrostomy, or E, percutaneous drainage. So A, hands for A, hands for B, C, D, E. All right, there are like five votes the entire time. So there may be some uh, people are not, not sure what to do in this situation, which is good. So in terms of drainage of pseudocysts, there are two endoscopic techniques. One is transpapillary drainage, where you basically assume that the pseudocyst is connected to the pancreatic duct. You place a pancreatic duct stent across the area where you believe the leak to be located, and you perform pancreatic sincterotomy. The other method is transmural drainage. We talked about this briefly yesterday during the video form, where basically you drain the cyst through the GI tract, either through the stomach or the duodenum. So this was this is a study uh, that came out last year in GIE where they compared transmural drainage versus doing a combined approach of both transmural and transpapillary drainage. And this was done mostly at large centers uh, from 2008 to 2014. And then when they looked at the technical success of these procedures, they found that transmural drainage was much more successful, right? so 97%. And obviously, it's a retrospective study. You know, some of these patients have obviously been selected because they thought they were endoscopically uh, feasibly able to be done. But you know, the surprising part was that only 44% of the patients who underwent combined approach were technically successful. And that's mostly because the transmural aspect of the procedure went well. But in already, only 46% of the patients were they able to get a pancreatic duct stent into the pancreatic duct. And it's often hard to cannulate the pancreatic duct in these patients when they've had pancreatitis um, and they may have a, a leak and so their pancreatic duct is very small. Um, so from a technical standpoint, it was very difficult to even do a combined approach. When they, when they looked at the outcomes of symptom resolution and radiographic resolution, they found that there's really no difference between the two groups. Right? And actually, UCLA was a participant in this uh, retrospective study, and we, we, we uh, contributed our patients uh, to this study. So their conclusion was that you can just do transmural drainage. That is sufficient to manage these uh, peripancular fluid collections. You don't, necessarily, you don't necessarily need to do a transpapillary approach in treating these patients. So getting back to this question, the answer is transmural drainage or an endoscopic cystgastrostomy. There appears to be little or no role for concurrent transpapillary drainage in the treatment outcomes of patients undergoing transmural drainage. So again, patient gets the wrong treatment, but undergoes a combined approach with both transpapillary and transmural drainage. 
But once again, the pancreatic cannulation is unsuccessful. Fortunately, the EUS guided cystic gastrostomy is technically successful in this case. And again, this is kind of the basic steps that we do to perform a, a traditional uh, EUS guided transgastric uh, drainage of a pseudocyst. We showed uh, you know, the, uh, the new axial stent yesterday at the video form. But typically, you, you hit the cyst through the stomach with the needle, you dilate the tract, you place a stent over the guide wire, and basically the cyst contents drain into the stomach. So here's a quick video, of kind of a traditional approach to a cyst gastrostomy. You can see the external compression of the cyst cavity in the stomach, seen endoscopically here. Then under EUS guidance, you can see this large pseudocyst. It's mostly fluid. You, don't, you see very little debris in this case. You puncture the cyst with a needle. You can inject contrast and check fluoroscopically to confirm that you're in the right space. Pass a guide wire into the cyst cavity. You're going to dilate the tract open with the balloon. And then place double pigtail stents within the, the cyst gastrostomy tract. Right. And this procedure can take 30 minutes to an hour. It's a bit stressful because the whole time you don't want to lose wire access, you're under fluoroscopy. Um, so it can be a, a bit of a stressful procedure there. And it, again, it takes a, it takes a while. And, Yes, we talked about this axial stent. You saw it being placed within uh, less than a minute, and that basically does all the things we just described in a minute in a much less stressful environment. So the common mistakes that are made in this case, an acute pancreatic uh, fluid collection without necrosis underwent fine needle aspiration. An asymptomatic patient with a large pancreatic pseudocyst underwent a drainage procedure. And transpapillary drainage alone was attempted to drain a large peripancreatic pseudocyst. So just some conclusions from the talk. MLS levels are elevated after ERCP in 75% of cases. Parental nutrition is the last option for nutritional support in the management of acute pancreatitis. Cholecystectomy should be performed on index admission in mild to moderate biliary pancreatitis. Most pancreatic fluid collections can be managed with watchful waiting. And transmural drainage of pancreatic fluid collections is an effective treatment option in selected patients. Thank you.